Hey everyone, welcome to another Manufacturing Live. Today we got some cool people involved. Um, but before we start, I want to remind everyone this is a live session. So please jump in, ask questions, interact. Jeff, it's great to have you back, man. But we have a couple other things going on here. Can you explain what we're doing today a little bit different than normal? Yeah, sure. And th thanks for having me, Mike. It's great to be back with everybody again. What, what we've got here, Northern Industrial is committed to... Uh, to having inclusion as well as accessibility for uh, a broad range of people and talents. And as such, we've brought in a sign interpreter named Marin that's going to be helping aid in bringing a, a nice level of, of inclusion and accessibility. And this beautiful girl also happens to be my girlfriend and we're just so happy to have her on board. Yeah, we're really excited to be able to add this to uh, this session as well. And, you know, it, it, in our previous conversation that you and I had, we, we talked about all the cool things that Northern is doing to improve the community and, and things like that around, you know. I, I think first off, though, let's start with what is it that Northern does for the people that didn't see the last episode? Yeah, so for the people that didn't see the last episode, Northern Industrial is a manufacturer of precision thrust washers, selective shims, and a wide variety of what we like to call round metal flat parts. And what these, what these parts specifically do, they go into applications like transmissions, axles, electrific electrification vehicles around the wheel and around the power takeoff units. And basically what, what those components do that we produce are designed to take up the manufacturing tolerances. And we talked about this a little bit on the last episode, so I won't go too much into it, but basically when you bring all the components from the manufacturing process into the application and install them on the vehicles, uh, us manufacturers know there's no such thing as a perfect part. And so the story I told last time, I'll tell it briefly here, is if you've got 10 suppliers that are supplying parts that go into, let's say, an electric vehicle and the, the gear drive for an electric vehicle. When the design engineers come in and design the parts, let's say they could be, when the suppliers actually design the part, they could be perfectly to tolerance, which would be a zero. They could be on the high side of tolerance, which would be a plus one. And they could be on the low end of tolerance, which we could call minus one. When all of those components come in and are brought in by the 10 suppliers, if all of them are at the low end, you'll, you'll have a minus 10. Well, they would come then to us for a plus 10 shim, plus 10 minus 10 equals zero, that, that system is then going to be optimized. And so where we play is that last little bit onto the power transmission application that basically makes everything right from the supply chain. <clears throat> so for people that don't know or just getting into manufacturing, even though you put a dimension on a drawing does not mean that's what gets manufactured. And in order to make it correct, we need people like Jeff and his company to sort of save the bacon, if you will, for how we how we manufacture to produce a part that goes out into the real world. Exactly. Yep. Now, it, it sounds fairly simple, but when you start talking power transmission and, and you go through that and um, I, I growing up on the farm and building hot rods and things like that, it's not as simple as a plus 10 or a minus 10. There's lots of components that go into that. And you brought up something interesting there with electrification. What is that new genre look like for someone like what you're doing with, uh, you know, creating those shims and spacers and flat stock that goes in there? Yeah, it's very interesting. And you're seeing this challenge play out all across the landscape for the automotive industry. Because when you look at the electrification landscape, let's talk automobiles, because that's the industry that we play in. A traditional internal combustion engine has really three main components to it. You've got an engine that creates the power. It takes fossil fuels and converts that into moving motion. And then you've got a transmission. And the transmission basically is the 
is the system that transmits the energy or the power from the fossil fuel then the engine in, into the transmission. And those that, that motion and energy is transferred into the wheels to get you moving forward or reverse if you're in reverse. And then there's a component within that that helps you if, in, if you could imagine being on a slippery road, let's say, and you're on ice, well, the front wheel and the back wheel, you don't want them necessarily going the same speed because the front wheel is slipping. So they have to go at a different speed. Or if you're taking a curve, the left wheel and the right wheel are gonna be going at different speeds. And so you need some sort of differential to be able to help the wheels. So those are the three key components to an internal combustion engine, uh, internal combustion engine vehicle. Well, what you're seeing now in the electrification space is a redoing of the entire automobile supply chain. For example, in an electric car, there is no engine <clears throat> and there, there is no transmission because there's no engine and no need to necessarily transmit in a purely electrified vehicle that energy. And so you see a lot of manufacturers like Northern Industrial Manufacturing having to somewhat change the way and, and the products in which we do business. Northern's fortunate. We're not reinventing necessarily our product. Our product's still round, flat, and shiny, but we are needing to reinvent the application. So for example, if there's no transmission and there's no engine, is there still an axle? And in many electric vehicle designs, there is. Are there differentials in a direct drive, for example? A lot of the electrified vehicles <clears throat> are seeing that there's a direct drive application where you've got a, a motor placed on each of the four corners of the car, and you're still going to need to be able to shim that to, to make sure that the tolerances stack up. So for Northern, we're seeing this transition happen pretty nicely, but you've got a lot of different companies, for example, an engine maker or a transmission producer that, what do you do now? I, I'm the world's best engine manufacturer, and the world isn't forecasted in 20 years to need engines. And so you're seeing the whole industry, the whole supply chain, you're seeing them try to figure out who they are. Are they going into autonomous vehicles, more technology pieces, things of that nature? So it's been a real interesting dynamic as supply chains are ramping up and supply chains are ramping down. But luckily, Northern Industrial is well positioned for the future because you mentioned it in the in the earlier segment, there is no such thing as a perfect part. And so as long as perfection doesn't exist, there's going to be a need to, to have Northern and companies like us around. Yeah, I, I mean, the, the business that you're in can definitely, there's a huge future for it because there, no matter how much automation you put in, there's still stack up, there's still tolerances, there's still you know, is it made on a Monday or Friday robots, you know, you can still misprogram those and put out a batch that isn't uh, correct, if you will. We, we did have a good question come in, and I think this one's right up your alley. Um, the question is, what are the materials you work with and what post-processing do you do to maintain accuracy? Yeah, that's actually a really good question. So one of the unique aspects of our business, this is going to be a, a relatively short story long, but because we're that last node in the supply chain, we have to be able to move quick because our customers can't give us forecasts, can't give us lead time because they don't know how the supply chain was doing four or five days ago when the supply chain was making the parts that are now being assembled today. And so one of the things that we've done, and actually my grandfather started the business over 40 years ago, is we vertically integrated. So the short answer on the material side of things, for the most part, we're using steel. These are traditional carbon-based steel, SAE 1008, through in general, let's say SAE 1075, with the occasional 1095, which is ultra high carbon material. And then we do some stainless steel work as well. But one of the things that we've done, and mostly out of necessity, is we've vertically integrated. And so one of the unique parts of Northern is controlling our own destiny when it comes to the in-house processing. So we do stamping, grinding, media finishing, deburring, color coding. 
We even do heat setting on some heat treated parts. And we do all of that in house so that we can shoot orders in a very quick and timely manner through our plant. Because what ends up happening is we'll get a call at 8 a.m. and say, whoops, the parts we've been using the last six months, a supplier down the line changed what they were doing. And now we're, we're all of a sudden using a part we haven't used in five years. We need you to make them and we need you to make them now. And in many cases, because of that vertical integration and some supply chain techniques that we've embedded into our system, we're able to help our customers in hours, in many cases, be able to get their lines back up and running, even on a part that hasn't been produced by us or needed by them in many years. There's another question that come in, but you talked about something there that I, I think is interesting to, to touch on a little bit more without giving up the secret sauce of what Northern does here. You know, you talk about orders coming in and, and being capable to promise and, and delivery schedules and things like that. Let's talk a little bit about um, the system that you have in place to manage that chaos, because to me, hearing you describe that sounds like every day is chaos. Um, Because I can imagine all of that coming in. So can you talk a little bit about how you're managing that? Yes, yes, definitely. And the the primary way we manage it, we we have a system called Delmia Works. And we incorporated this into our business in 2014 extremely successfully. Before this system came in, it's ERP. And ERP stands for Enterprise Resource Planning. And Basically what this is, it's a streamline of the entire operation, soup to nuts. This includes accounting. It includes the label that you print out, sending it to a customer. It knows forecasts because you can have them loaded, EDI, which is electric data interchange. All of those different things are embedded into one system. And what we've done is we've, we've used complex forecasting tools through the system to basically use an inventory max minimum that we bolt on top of our customer's volumetric forecast backwards looking, because we don't know what they're gonna need forwards looking. We can only look backwards in this case. And so we load that into the system. We then overlay a maximum and minimum. So we wanna have five to 10,000 parts. And what it ends up doing is out of, let's say the, 850 parts that we could produce for a customer, we may only need to produce 15 to 20 of those based on consumption at maximum minimums falling below a minimum, if you will. So it takes this giant, complicated, up and down, left and right supply chain, and it shoves it into, all right, well, this week we got to work on these 20 parts. I know my daily capacity is 75,000 pieces per day. I know how many pieces I'm short on and it really streamlines the operation. And we could not be happier with the ERP system that we were using with, with Delmia Works. They really do a good job for us. Well, and it's interesting. There's a couple of things you mentioned there that make sense when you describe it, right? But when a lot of people hear the term ERP or MES, they, they get a little nervous, they freak out a little bit. But in a practical application, what it's doing is helping you process and visualize data, right? I mean, that's one of the biggest challenges you have is where you've been and where you're going, correct? Absolutely. And I think what's interesting about the topic is a lot of people get overwhelmed by the conversation and they say, wow, you're generating so much data and so many inputs. But at the end of the day, as business owners and as manufacturers, the only thing we have to make decisions off of is data. And so I think what you're going to start to see as society becomes more efficient, more proactive, uh, less reactive, I think what you're going to start to see is data become king. And I think for some aspects, we're already seeing it. So for example, Walmart is a, is a grocery retail, retailer that I think most people in the audience would be familiar with. And people don't look at them as a manufacturing company. They're a, they're a grocery store. But if you think about it, there's not much difference between supply chain, for example, and the keys of supply chain to manufacturing. Well, Walmart 
has in, embedded in their systems, if there is a forecast for a hurricane to hit, there are about 50 different items, not 1,000, not 10,000. There are about 50 different items where quite literally all routes for all trucks in their network are routed into the DCs that support that hurricane because they know that that's going to be stocked up upon. This might be your toilet paper. It might be your bottled water. Different. It might be things we're not even thinking of, like, you know, bubble gum that's strawberry flavored. I mean, they know that even when, even as consumers, we, we wouldn't. And so data as a manufacturer is key. And with Delmia Works, the data and the inputs that we're given allow us in ownership to make those key decisions. Do we need a new press? Do we need to increase raw material? Do we see lead times extending so we've got to get safety stock and, and increase banks? Not all that dissimilar to what Walmart would do in a hurricane. Yeah, which, which makes a lot of sense, right? Because we're now all competing on a bigger scale than we used to. Um, before, before I get too far, I, I got to pay the bills here. So, you know, make sure you hit like, and subscribe the notification bell. You know, we do these every beginning of every month around Tuesday at 11 AM Eastern. So please jump in on that. Um, I agree wholehearted, wholeheartedly with you, Jeff. Um, we do have another question that I want to get to, and I, I'm interested to hear your thought because this is one of the ones I don't know the answer on. Um, can you suggest any material that can take up the swelling of battery cells during charging or discharging as a shim, which will maintain clearance between two prismatic cells and maintain its dimension? That is probably not going to be me. I mean, I've certainly heard. So, so the short answer, the political answer is no, I am definitely not your guy to answer the question, but conceptually, I think something like a visqueen or a plastic, because again, you mentioned the thermal transfer and taking up the thermal transfer. You're gonna have, the, the, the thermal transfer is going to occur. So I, I think it's all about searing that ther thermal transfer into a direction that you want it to go because the battery is gonna heat up. You're gonna, you're gonna do what you've gotta do, but not probably the person. It's a great question, but I, I don't think I know the answer to, but, you're probably not going to want to use metal because it'll be conductive. And yep. so I don't think you're going to end up wanting to use metal. So it's going to be a non-metallic type substance, visqueen, um, G12, some sort of plastic that could possibly be a spacer. I think in the olden days, they would have used asbestos. Yeah, I think that's in general what, what asbestos was used for was yeah. some of those were thermal capacitance where you don't, you don't want to get any of that thermal transfer, but um, you stumped me. Well, we all know how asbestos turned out. So that probably, yeah, worked. don't use it. I can tell you don't use asbestos. <laughs> um, so good question though. <laughs> that is a really good question. And it, it got my head spinning of, well, maybe there's a future business for somebody, right? Figuring that out and solving the problem. That is a, a huge, um, return on investment. If you can figure that one out. Oh yeah. So let's talk a little bit about, Northern. You guys uh, have been around for a couple of days. Let's talk a little bit about the history, how we got here, and then we'll we'll go into a little bit about, you know, employees and, and what you're doing to make the world around Northern a better place. Yeah. So Northern got started by my grandfather in 1979. And really the reason we got started was, was this niche in we tell the story all the time. There's a lot of companies that stamp and there's a lot of companies that grind and there's even few companies that media finish and deburr. And what ended up happening is the world at the time was trying to service this very specific niche in the selective shim and the selective space or market by, by piecemealing. And in some ways, our competitors, that's how they're trying to compete with us today is piecemealing. So you'll, you'll go to a stamper and say, Mr. Stamper, I need Mr. and Mrs. Stamper. I need this. Get the stamped parts, send it out. Okay. Grinder. I need this. Bring it out. Media finisher. I need this to burn. And all of a sudden you, you've got this very complicated up and down 
supply chain that each has its own unique lead times. They have their own unique cost centers. And in a system or circumstance that's very complicated, you can't forecast it. Remember, we can only look backwards. We can't look forwards. It becomes very fragmented and difficult. And so Northern was founded by my grandfather to say, okay, I'm going to try to do this all for my customer. And at, at that time, it was General Motors, and they're still one of our, our larger customers. But we've, we've vertically integrated even more. We're, we're getting closer tolerance. Currently, we've got grind capability that can do plus or minus five microns. And so the average human hair, depending on your hair and the human, can be upwards of 200 to 250 microns. So you're talking about, you know, one, can't even do the math live, to be honest, but you're talking about probably 1 80th, 1 90th of the human hair. My math could be off there, but very tight and precise components. What makes Northern a little bit unique is we're making hundreds of, we're making 75,000 of those components every day. So a lot of the aerospace companies, yeah, plus or minus five microns, no problem. I can make you 30 this month. Well, for us, that's not even set up. For us, we're, we're looking at trying to get 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 pieces an hour so that we can get those high volumes, but we also have to be super precise. Very unique, very challenging type place to be in the automotive space, but also very rewarding at the same time. Yeah, and you mentioned, I think in our last discussion, you talked about some of the awards that you've won from General Motors to be able to supply at that um, that range. And being a, a GM guy myself for building a lot of old cars and that, you know, it, that's pretty amazing if you think about it. Um, and, and I think it is important to have that context too. You are doing a volume business with high accuracy where a lot of people can maybe do one or two, but they're not built to put out that kind of volume. Um, what, can you explain a little bit about the award that you've, you've won a few times from GM? Yeah, actually awards plural, not to, not to correct you, but yeah, we were fortunate enough. It was kind of, kind of interesting. I mentioned we implemented our ERP system in 2014. We actually had won, this was through the implementation. So for those of you implementing concerned about issues with impacting quality and delivery, we, we. Had won the, we have won the GM Supplier Excellence Award, which is zero parts per million defect, 100% on-time delivery, and a superior rating for engineering and technical support to General Motors since 2014. We won it eight years in a row. And so we're very happy with these awards. To do that eight years in a row takes a real considerable effort from every member of our team every single day and we just couldn't be happier we've got a great great business model and sometimes stressful but at the end of the day that our customers needs and expectations always come first and we want to meet or exceed those every single day yeah eight years in a row that's that is mind-blowing almost because there's been a lot going on in the last eight years outside of just doing manufacturing so you mentioned something there that I want to talk about a little bit, which is it takes everyone involved. So how do you build a team and a culture that all sees that goal to get that type of accolade at the end of the year, right? Like it, it's like people are like herding cats these days almost. So how, how do you do it at Northern to make that magic happen? Yeah, this has been a really concerted effort from ownership lately, especially, because one of the things that we've always done well is making the part. But what we've recently migrated into is more of a concerted effort around the employee and around engaging the employee. One of the things early that we did to engage the employee that we're very happy with is we've implemented what's called a Bright Idea Award. And I, I would argue this is one of the best in class examples of the implementation of this, maybe with a little bias, but we've kept it very simple, very straightforward. If you come up with an idea, any employee, any time that improves safety, improves the environmental footprint of the plant, improves product quality, improves throughput, 
or lowers the company cost, that idea is submitted directly to me, directly to the owners, and reviewed by my team of managers every week. And if we implement the idea automatically, if we implement it and it does one of those five things, uh, the employee is given a $50 gift certificate and also has their name on, on a plaque. And every quarter we shut down and we announce who came up with the idea, what the idea was, especially on safety topics. We wanna to make sure that that's rolled out so people know that there's a safer way of doing things. And these ideas, can be so basic as a caution wet floor sign that for whatever reason was used through the history of our company, it got stopped being used and we, we re-implemented it all the way to an idea that one of my employees came up with that literally they were lifting these, these we do metal stamping and they were lifting the scrap one three gallon bucket at a time to the tune of 2.5 million pounds a year that my team was lifting one three gallon bucket at a time and had a, had a guy come to me and say, hey, I wanna submit this idea to convey it. Can we use a conveyor? Quite literally, it cost the company less than $1,000. It was about $300 a conveyor and we implemented four presses, $1,200 if you do the math. But basically that's a very small amount to improve your employees' well-being to the tune of 2.5 million pounds a year. And so this, uh, these ideas, we've implemented close to 500 different ideas since about 2015 and just are so happy with the way it's engaged the employee, the way that it's come up with some great ideas. And then the other piece to that is for the last three years, we've engaged some, some consultants that are actually going out and surveying our employees. Since the company's founding, our, our, the owners, you know, myself included, have been up there saying, what can we do to make your jobs easier? How can we make things be improved? We always have an open door policy. These are things you hear about in manufacturing. And at the end of the day, what we found, and it was actually, the first one was disheartening, but no one believed that. I mean, you could have the owner. I'm sitting there and my boss, you know, another owner is up there stating, talk to me, come into my office. And it's just such, it's so easier said than done. And when we went out and actually surveyed our employees, we said, we want your feedback. They were expressing the opposite. And they were saying, we feel like it's a culture where it's not engaging. It's not something that, we could improve on. It is something that we could improve on to start to help that process. And since taking these surveys, we've been taking them very seriously. We've gone out and we've really improved upon the lowest three or four criterias. And we've had two different iterations and we've just really improved things um, to a large degree. And so we can't be happier with that because once you start to get the data and we, we mentioned data earlier, data is king. You don't know what you don't know. And as we started to become exposed to our employees' thoughts and wishes and ways to improve, we've really been able to do tremendous things with our business. Yeah, you, you hit on some key things there. We, we've just finished a survey and we'll be producing the results here pretty soon. But we went out to a bunch of companies around the world and we asked them the simple question of, how well do you collaborate and communicate? And we asked it at different levels of management. We didn't spec what collaboration and communication meant. We just asked the question. And one of the things that we found is there is a clear division between the haves and the have nots. The ones that admit they communicate and collaborate well um, are seeing increased success to the tune of gaining up to 20% new customers every year. The ones that admittedly do not communicate well are losing up to 20% of customers every year. And they don't even know why. And when you ask at these different levels, what was interesting about it was the ownership in a lot of these companies had a clear plan. But when it came to implementing, mentoring, creating a culture, there was no plan in place beyond, we just created a plan, everybody should do it. So there was a huge disconnect 
exactly the wash your hands scenario right it, but it was interesting because you know we have collaboration and communication and what it means to us but when you just ask the simple question it was a really eye-opening thing of of a disconnect there now the when you talk about you know bringing in consultants and things like that you know I, i'm a little bit older I, I go back to the bobs at office space right um you know and that's a tongue-in-cheek thing but i've <laughs> seen a lot of those consultants over the years you know, when you went and got your your people to do those consultants, was it a purely outside firm that like brought them all in like the Bobs or was it they went and lived out in the shop with them? What was that process like? Yeah. So for us, where we're primarily using the consultants was in the data gathering space. And, and so the Bobs is a good analogy that that's starting to look at job consolidation and figuring out what people are doing, mapping out different communication nodes. There was a famous Harvard business study that was done on Mercury Marine outboard engines. They brought in the Bobs and basically figured out to make one outboard engine, it re the engine required something crazy like 2,800 moves up and down, back and forth, across the street to this supplier, to that supplier. And the bobs came in, and at the end, it was like three or 400 moves to make the same outboard engine. What we're talking about here isn't, isn't that way. What we're using the consultants for is basically to come in and gather the data in terms of employee surveys, employee feedback, and we're, we're tailoring the, that data. We're getting the data. We're gathering it. And then we're overlaying it against benchmarks, against it's a Gallup type organization that is designed for manufacturers similar in our space. And then understanding, okay, in general, employees across our industry, 10, 20, 50,000 of them across the world are behaving and wanting to see it this way. They're wanting to see business structured this way. They're, they're wanting to see a feeling of safety with a score of four, where, where do we rank, where do our employees feel for safety compared to every other employee out there in the industry? And I can say, we're happy about it. That's the one mark where we're well above benchmark. Our employees have a feeling of safety when it comes to our plant. Communication, not one of our strong points. Our employees feel that the way our organization from top to bottom is communicating isn't as effective in their minds as other employees for other organizations. We, we miss the benchmark there. And, and we don't miss it now because communication was our first benchmark miss. We've since overhauled our company. And in our last one, we nailed communication. Where we missed is what's called do over say ratio. And what this is, is basically our employees are hungry for action they see bright ideas and they come up with an idea that makes their job easier, allows them to get more parts out the door. But our management team, for whatever reason, uh, is so bogged down that we'll, we're going to say that we'll do it. Oh, yeah, we'll implement those conveyors. And oh, it takes us four months to purchase the conveyors when quite literally the employees like I could call up a company and have the conveyor here in six days, what's taking so long. And so that was the biggest challenge for this year. And what's interesting and actually kind of fun for me is the way we're tackling this problem is kind of fun and unique. We're actually empowering and putting more in, in a cool way onto the employee. Uh, so for example, it's kind of funny, I'm, I'm helping mentor one of the employees, but he wants to come up with a, with a workbench and a visual 5S scenario where he's going to put the tools on the tool board, paint the tools, and he's going to optimize his closet and his area for, for what he wants moving forward. Normally, what would happen is he would say, I want to optimize this. Can you help me optimize it? And then the management team would take a whole bunch of time because we've got a bunch of different things. And... At the end of the day, he doesn't get the tool board. It doesn't get implemented or it gets implemented slow. He's left with a negative impression of first and foremost, the management team isn't doing what they need to be doing and they're slow. And second of all, that we don't care that 
his job isn't being optimized. So then it, you get a, an impression of, all right, well, whatever, I'll just do what he's doing. So what we've taken the tactic part of this is with the consultants, which has been great, but we said, great, that is a good idea. We want to implement. In fact, it's a bright idea. Get it submitted. But we're going to have you come up. All right, what, what do you need? Help us design this and come up with color schemes. Come up with what tools. Come up with where we're going to put the tools. Come up with size of workbench, size of, of the, the hoist that you're using, size of the you know wrenches and whatnot. And oh, by the way, when, when can we have that done? How quickly can you get that to us? And we'll get it for you on order. Oh, oh um, how quickly? Uh, two weeks. Okay. Two weeks goes by. Hey, where are we with that? You know, so, so all of a sudden in this do over say ratio, instead of it being a scenario where the actual employee is saying, it's been two weeks, it's been three weeks, it's been four weeks, where are you? We're saying, hey, we're hungry for your input. We're hungry. Where are you? Well, well, geez, I have a day job. I, you know, I'm, I'm trying to stamp. I'm trying to grind. I'm trying. Well, yeah, I understand that. But it's important to us that we streamline your job. And we know it's important to you. So now all of a sudden, what this is also doing for us is it's saying, okay, employee XYZ, let's get your input. Let's get your feedback. Okay, employee XYZ, let's also you know, have you help our management team do work that they don't have to do. But it's now also saying our job actually isn't as easy as just going and ordering something. You need to know the specs. You need to know the dimensions. And then when you order them, if you're wrong, <laughs> you then have to start the whole process over again. So when the pressure's on you, you know, that employee, I'm going to laugh with them and show them the video. He's only got currently this project. I, I currently have over 120 different things going on and that's just one of the 120. And so it's, it's, I laugh about it and, and it's, it's something that we can joke about, but I think if organizations across the board, manufacturing or not, can flip into this mindset, all of a sudden you get that employee buy-in because it's their project and you get that shared resource because now that employee is doing their work and thinking nothing but that one or two or three tasks. And we've, we've really seen an impact. We just took surveys two weeks ago. Results are going to be back probably by the 1st of December. I'm going to be curious to see if that do over say ratio dramatically improves. I, I feel like it's gonna in a big way for that reason. Yeah. You touched on a lot of points there. And um, it's funny because there's actually a number of jobs I've left over the years because of that exact same thing. Um, and, and I think that there's there's an interesting process that happens where and it, it comes down to humans suck at communicating, if we're just going to be honest, right? We're, that's not something we inherently do well. Um, but there's this hierarchical thing that has happened in manufacturing to where uh, you go from the shop into an office and then it's like, oh, well, they got the cushy office job. And then they never really see the full picture of everybody throughout the organization has a full plate. And I, I think, you know, allowing p everyone to feel like they have a say to me has always made the most sense. But unfortunately, a lot of companies aren't built that way because there then comes in that hierarchy level of control. Uh, if you will, like, oh, I worked really hard. I spent 15 years in the shop to get into this office. Now it's my job to, to shine and make it work. And I don't want to give up anything. Um, you know, I, I really love the e explanation you gave there, because I think the key for future employees, which we'll touch on here in a second, is they want to feel part of something bigger. They don't want to be a cog in a machine from what we've seen. And so having the ability for them to have a say in how their daily life is going to happen, um, especially when you consider throughout an entire year, they spend more time at work than they do anywhere else, is key to success in manufacturing. So in part of your, your discovery and things um, that you're going through and collecting data, I'm curious on one thing, because I know the average age of machinist in the United States is 49 years old. In that data that you are collecting, are they breaking it by age or generation? Because from what we're seeing, the next generation of employee definitely wants to have a different culture than like what we grew up in ourselves. Yeah, 
So I'll answer that twofold. Uh, the, the one thing I wanted to double back on, and you, you talk about employee engagement and, and being on mission. The ultimate goal, I think, of any corporation is this really cute story that they tell about John F. Kennedy when he was touring NASA during the Great Space Race. And he was interviewing, not interviewing, but he was talking to everybody, you know, hey, what do you do here? What do you do here? And he talked to the janitor, and he, uh, to the custodial engineer at the time, and he said, hey, you know, what is it that you do here? And, and the custodial engineer's response was, Mr. President, I'm, I'm here to put a man on the moon. And, and so you get this, everybody rowing in the same boat where, you know what, that janitor or that custodial engineer isn't there to clean tables and to empty out trash cans. They're there to optimize the development of the company and to help build the world's greatest vehicles. And so I've, that, that's, that's the level we're trying to get to, our, our moon mission. Um, and so how we get employees engaged on that. And then to your, to your other question, actually, I forgot your other question. Um, it was about the data you're collecting with age difference. Yeah, the data. That's right. So in terms of the age, what we've decided to do, and I don't, I think this is because Gallup isn't maybe allowed to ask age and we're basing it off of a benchmark at Gallup is it's tenure with the company. And so we've bucketed our employees into tenure. And so you get a, a less than one year honeymoon employee. You get a, a one year to, I think, five year employee. These are the employees who are out of the honeymoon stage, but deciding whether or not this is their going to be their career, their passion, their focus. And then you get employees excess of five years. And, and in general, what we've seen with, with all companies in the data is after five years, that employees made the decision. I like it here. I like the culture. I like the career. I like the job and I like the advancement opportunities. I'm going to stay and, and make it a career in general. Obviously these are generalities. And so we don't bucket it by age, but we do bucket it by uh, both uh, manufacturing. So we've got a manufacturing specific bucket, maybe versus um, office. So hourly versus salary. But then we also have the just a general uh, um, years of service and between those two different unique categories, we're able to get the data that we need to determine what needs to be optimized. That makes sense. So uh, this is still live. So if anyone has any questions for Jeff, please chime in and and you know put them in the in the comments. We'll get them in and get them to Jeff. The we're coming up. We you know we have about another ten minutes or so uh, on what we're doing today. But the the one thing I guess we talked a little bit about electrification electrification. What do you think is the key in communities to support manufacturing? Because we talked about this a little bit last time. I want to touch it again because there seems to be a lot of initiatives to make manufacturing better. There's a lot of people that like to complain about it, but the reality is everybody has to do their part in their community to make the world a better place. So can you talk a little bit about what you've done or what you see or where you think it's going to make manufacturing not look like the dingy, dirty, dark cave in Iron Man? Yeah, well, there, there are certainly aspects of it, obviously, that are maybe dirtier than others. But at the end of the day, I think it's all about driving that inclusion and accessibility to a wide variety of, of different people, of different types of backgrounds, exposures, what have you. Some of the things that we're doing at Northern that we feel are, are, are pretty interesting is we're, we're, me specifically, I'm the chair of our Economic Development Corporation here in Harrison Township. And one of the things, we're in Macomb County, which is approximately 20 miles outside of downtown Detroit. And downtown Detroit is in Wayne County, a different county. And one of the things that we've done as part of an EDC is we actually have successfully petitioned and partnered with Wayne County, Macomb County, and the smart bus system within, within the tri-county area. We actually have a bus that express takes potential employees and potential labor uh, from downtown Detroit, which is a population of around 
maybe 400, 500,000 people. And in four stops, drops them right into a manufacturing hub that is my, my district here with, with the uh, industrial corridor. So obviously that exposes this corridor to people who potentially don't have access to vehicles, maybe can't drive. As we look at people who may have issues with being visually impaired or adults with disabilities who are required um, to take a, a public transportation system, this now opens it up. It opens up manufacturing. It opens up this entire corridor to, to be able to be helped and serviced by that population. And it also allows this corridor to help service that population. So it's a it's a win-win scenario. It doesn't have to be a zero-sum game where if I win, my next door neighbor has to lose. By making a move like that, we all win. And I think getting some of the underserved minority communities into manufacturing and for manufacturing that even includes women, um, certainly um, people, a variety of different backgrounds and, and colors, getting as many people into the industry and exposed to different types of communities, I think really helps and, and keeps us moving forward and in the right direction. Yeah. And I, I think that's some of the things that traditionally manufacturing has been overlooked, right? You know, it's, it's no longer all backbreaking manual labor type work. You know, you mentioned the conveyor systems and things like that. Like there's lots of things that can be put in that equals the playing field. So anyone that is willing to work can be in manufacturing and not just for pennies a day, but actually have a good sustainable income for the rest of their life. And I think that's some of the things that have changed over the years. You know, obviously it wasn't always that way, but the workforce of the future has, is now it applies to everyone, if you will. Yeah, sure does. Yeah. So uh, I don't see too many more questions. There are a couple things that, um, that that we can discuss here a little bit more. So let's talk about, uh, you mentioned Delmia Works in there. I want to talk about a, a couple more things related to that. So when you went through your process uh, back in 2014, you know, what, what did that scope look like? Like you, you bought it and we're implementing it with an idea. Has it expanded out to be completely bigger than what you originally started with? Like, how did you eat the fish? I guess is what some people. Yeah, say. that is, that is a million dollar question. We ended up implementing in phases. Uh, phase one is implement is what is normally just considered implementation. And this, this was large, but as I wasn't an owner at the time, but as, as the product champion, my main objective from ownership actually was a surprising, my payback wasn't a financial one. We were this very sophisticated manufacturer making close precision parts, and we could do that right. We had the systems in place, the quality systems in place. We were making the right part. And then we had to ship the part. And to ship a part, make a master label. You need an invoice. You need a packing slip. You need a bill of lading. Then you need to send an electronic data interchange, an EDI, and an advanced shipment notice. And all of a sudden, you know, we were hand typing all of that information. And if, if anybody knows anything about humans, good human beings are only right 95% of the time. And on average, we were required to probably type two to 300 characters Per shipment. And actually, it's going to be a lot more than that. That's just to get out of carton label. And, and so we were making all of those mistakes. And so ownership at the time said, I don't want to make those mistakes. And so we went from this very cumbersome six person, one person watching another person type so that when they were typing, if they made a mistake, one person could check to quite literally one click. So right now we build a pick ticket. The system knows how many pieces, it knows the part number, it knows the name, it knows the weight, it knows everything there is to know about the part and it even has a picture of the part so that our operator knows either picking the right part. And the pick tickets built and quite literally the label, your press print, it already knows a hundred pieces go in the box. It knows the name, it knows the, 
all the customer formatting with the different barcodes and 2D and 3D barcoding, all that's known going in. Everything's built. You press another button and the packing slip is printed. And so for us, the, the main implementation was all around these customer touch points and streamlining those particular touch points. But the other benefits we received is now all of a sudden, instead of scheduling and forecasting being in one plant manager's head, we're now putting that all onto the system. We're giving it the capability of knowing, all right, this I've got, let's say I've got 35 different machines. All of them need to be loaded in a certain way. Instead of having someone come up and say, hey, boss, what do I need to run? We can now give a schedule. Here are the next six jobs you need to run. Well, how much time does that save optimizing that, not having employees and managers coming back and forth and helping with the communication? So there was that. And then the forecasting piece. And then the other piece that we're, we're, we ended up rolling in was accounting. So instead of having a different system that didn't talk to manufacturing, that didn't talk to customer, that didn't talk to the EDI, all of a sudden, all everything right in phase one was talking to one another. It was streamlined. It was easy. Probably painful, not even painful, but probably we had to duel our systems, which caused everybody a little more work for about a month. But after that, we dropped every other independent system and we went to one. Then what we did, that was what we call implementation phase one. And that basically was accounting production. That was getting the company running, understanding what we need, EDI, communicating with the customer, printing labels, et cetera. Phase two, we then implemented our quality system. And so for those of you who have to be ISO or IETF, you got all those binders. You've got, you got to have a binder in every room. And when you know, Tracy over in tooling makes a small change in something she's doing, you then have somebody who's got to go to each individual room across your company to change out that one work instruction that, that Tracy changed. We, went, we got rid of that. We went, we, we did that live within Delmia Works, could not be happier. We've got permissions set up so anyone can make a change, but once they make that change, it goes through a hierarchy. And then once it's approved, it's now accessible to every single person across every single computer in the organization. The other thing that we did is we started keeping track of outgoing statistical capability and process control. How well are we doing with our capabilities? And what's interesting there is we found out through this data that supplier XYZ actually has an offset of three microns, which if you're in a plus or minus five or six micron environment, if you're off three microns, that's quite a bit. So it gets back to this data by analyzing our suppliers. We had never analyzed it. We collected the data. It went into a binder somewhere and no one looked at it. Well, all of a sudden ownership's looking at this and saying, well, why is this subsegment of parts having a lower CPK, which is a statistical capability. Why are these subsegments lower? Oh, well, they had an issue with their machine and it was offset three microns. We made one phone call, shifted the, their nominal up three microns, and all of a sudden what was statistically maybe a 1.3 CPK is now a 1.99 CPK, which is it goes from 99.9% .9 of our parts being, um, being good now where before it might've only been 90, 99, 90, 95 to 99%, which when you're making a couple million parts, that adds up to a lot of bad parts. <laughs> yes, very quickly. <laughs> so yeah, we, we could not be happier. And we've got pretty much the entire company running through our, through Delmia Works. We've got preventative maintenance, EDI, all the label and document creation, scheduling, forecasting, purchasing, we run all our pricing through the system. We run all our, that's on the buy side and the sell side. We just really couldn't be happier with it. And my team all the time just says, whoa, there is no way we could be doing this without. And that includes, we've probably grown our company since 2014, upwards of 60 or 70% with a, with a further trajectory to do that again in the next four to five years. And we could not do that without a backbone and an infrastructure that was built for growth. Yeah. And you hit on a lot of really good things there. And I, I think that's one of the things that the market, some people in the market don't quite understand is the people that will win the future 
competition are the ones that have data at their side that you can no longer run a company based off gut feeling or, you know, just having handshake agreements with people locally, because if you have data, you're going to make a smart decision faster than, than the one person that just used to hold it all together with the knowledge in their head and, you know, the gut feel, right? Yeah. And no, by the way, I mean, people retire, people get hit by buses, people decide to leave the company. I mean, yeah. So it's really all about processes and enabling uh, and fostering an, an avenue of our employees to be able to be somewhat autonomous. Yeah. Yeah. I, I couldn't agree more with that. Um, we're coming up. we get a couple minutes left. I got to pay the bills one more time here um, and then, then we'll end up. So there, there's a couple things that we have coming up. I think everyone is aware we have 3D Experience World coming up in 2023. Jeff, we talked. I think you're going to be there. So if anyone wants to pick Jeff's brain and learn a little bit more about how they do what they do, um, please register for 3D Experience World. Look up Jeff. He'll be wandering around. He's one of our – we're lucky to have someone um, as good at manufacturing as Jeff that will be there. Um, obviously we mentioned subscribing to the channel, hitting the like button notifications. We do have two other things coming up later this week. We have SolidWorks live, uh, coming up on Thursday at 11 Eastern time. I'm in central. So I always got to remember the East versus the West time zone here. Um, and we're going to talk with the guys or the folks from, uh, Resumen, uh, talking about some advanced SolidWorks simulation and mining equipment. I saw a little bit of the demo set. It is awesome. You want to check in for that. And then on Friday, um, one of my peers, Chris McBain, is going to talk with Noah, and we're going to have the battle of additive versus subtractive um, and, and discuss when and where and how and why those things uh, fit in our design for the future. Uh, you know, myself, I've been doing the subtractive for a long time, similar to uh, Jeff here. You know, we're, we're a little bit on that side of it. But subtractive. We'll That's right. Um, you know, but additive has its method and, you know, I think maybe at 3d experience world, if you come by the shop floor, we might have a little bit of a treat for you there with some additive and subtractive together. So please go check those out Thursday and Friday, uh, Friday, November 18th. Sorry, my bad. Not, not, not both this week. So Thursday is simulation on, uh, November 17th at 11 AM Friday, November 18th at 12 Eastern is when we're going to talk about additive versus subtractive. So with that, Jeff and Marin, I cannot thank you both enough for being on here. Um, next time I make it up your way, I definitely need to come stop by. So with that, yeah. thank you all. And I'd like to I'd like to thank Marin also because she really has helped add that level of inclusion and accessibility. And so just can't can't thank her enough. And thank you, Mike and team. Thanks, everyone.